the lower limbs, the iliac crest. The crest of the ilium or iliac crest is the superior border of the wing of the ilium and the superolateral margin of the greater pelvis. The iliac crests may be palpated starting posteriorly from the posterior superior iliac spine, then progress superiorly and anteriorly until the anterior superior iliac spine is felt. Alternatively, the hands may be rested on the uppermost border of the iliac crests by sliding them down the abdominal oblique muscles. When a firm contact is established, you can trace the bony crest anteriorly until you reach the projections of the anterior superior iliac spine. Repeat this procedure posteriorly until you contact the posterior superior iliac spine. The anterior superior iliac spine. The anterior superior iliac spine refers to the anterior extremity of the iliac crest of the pelvis. They are held approximately 30 centimeters apart, but they are slightly wider in females. They provide attachments for the inguinal ligament, the sartorius muscle, and the tensor fascia latae. The anterior superior iliac spine is an important landmark of the surface anatomy. The apex of the iliac crests crosses the spinous process of L4, or it is at the level of L4-5 intervertebral space in about 80% of the population. The posterior superior iliac spine. The posterior border of the ala can be traced until a firm rounded projection is reached. In most individuals, when standing, they may be identified by two dimples superior and medial to the glutei muscles. They are commonly referred to as the dimples of Venus. The distance between the two posterior superior iliac spines is shorter than the anterior superior iliac spines, and although variable, they are about 10 cm apart. The posterior superior iliac spine serves for the attachment of the oblique portion of the posterior sacroiliac ligaments and the multifidus muscle. They are used as reference landmarks of the lumbar spine. The posterior superior iliac spine crosses the spinous process of S2 more consistently than the iliac crests with the L4, and it is therefore considered a more reliable landmark. The ischiotuberosities. These are two large bony protrusions on the inferior most margin of the ischium. They are located deep within the glutei and are commonly referred to as the sitting bones. They can be palpated when the patient is prone so that the glutei are more relaxed. You can feel this if they were to sit bolt upright at the edge of the couch with your outstretched palms placed underneath. They mark the lateral boundary of the pelvic outlet. The greater trochander of the femur. This is a large projection on the proximal part of the femur that serves for muscle attachments. The greater trochander is located lateral to the hip joint and they are easy to palpate. They are just inferolaterally in relation to the hip joint. If the hand is placed flat against the skin about 10 centimeters below the iliac crests and the subject rotates their hip while standing, you will feel the movement of the large rounded protrusion of the greater trochanter. The lesser trochanter. This may be palpated indirectly as it is shielded deep within the medial compartment of the thigh. They are inferior and medial to the greater trochanters. With the hip placed in slight flexion, abduction and external rotation, place progressive pressure with the tips of your fingers medially and inferiorly.
to the inguinal ligament. By moving the hips from passive flexion to extension, you may feel the resistance of the tensing iliopsoas tendon. If the bursa is inflamed, it will be tender. The medial and lateral femoral condyles. First, let us identify the joint line of the knee. This is the space between the femoral and tibial condyles. It can be identified by a soft depression on either side of the inferior part of the patella when the knee is in 90 degree flexion. These are two large rounded or convex projections at the end of the femur which form the articulating surfaces with the tibia below. The medial condyle is larger than the lateral condyle. On the posterior surface of the medial condyle, the linea aspera, this is a ridge running down the posterior shaft of the femur, turns into the medial supracondylar ridge. With the knee flexed to 90 degrees, part of the condyles may be palpated on either side of the patella. The medial and lateral epicondyles of the femur. These are two outermost protrusions of the medial and lateral surfaces of the condyles. The epicondyles are best palpated with the knee in flexion. Run your fingers medially and laterally from the patella. The adductor tubicle forms a slightly larger protrusion on the medial epicondyle, about 2 cm proximal to that the medial and lateral tibial condyles. These are just below the femoral condyles. Their superior surface is flat, forming the tibial plateau. The medial tibial condyle is slightly larger than the lateral. Apart from the posterior borders, the rest of the condyles are easily palpable. At the lateral tibial condyle, about one centimeter below the posterior lateral perimeter, the rounded head of the fibula can be palpated with ease, the patella. This sesamoid bone provides attachments for the quadriceps muscles above and the patella ligament below. When the knee is held in extension, it is mostly situated over the femur in the trochlea between the lateral and medial ridges. The patella is broadened superiorly with a slightly convex superior border but pointed and narrower at its inferior margin. With the knee passively extended, it is easily mobile but it is rigid when the knee is in flexion. The tibial tuberosity. This is a large rounded protrusion on the proximal anterior aspect of the tibia in line with the patella. It forms the attachment of the patella ligament. It is more palpable when the knee is flexed. The medial malleolus of the ankle joint. This forms the most distal projection of the tibia. It forms a pyramidal-like process. Its internal surface forms the medial border of the tibiotalar joint, the lateral malleolus of the ankle joint. This forms the most distal projection of the fibula. It also forms a pyramidal-like process. Its internal surface forms the lateral border of the talocrural joint. The lateral malleolus descends to a slightly lower level than the medial malleolus, the calcaneus. This is the largest bone in the foot. A roughened area on its posterior superior aspect marks the attachment of the Achilles tendon. The cuboid bone articulates with its anterior and lateral sides. The navicular articulates with its anterior and medial sides. On the medial side of the calcaneum, below the middle talar facet, 
is the sustentaculum tali. This serves for the attachments of several ligaments. The talus. This bone forms a hinge-like joint located between the malleoli of the tibia and fibula. Most of its superior surface is covered by the distal tibiofibular joint unless the foot is held in full plantar flexion. In this position, between your thumb and index fingers, you will feel the anterior part of the head of the talus. Directly anterior to the talus, you can feel the talonavicular joint, the cuboid. This is located laterally within the tarsals of the foot. Its position can be identified by following the extended proximal projection of the fifth metatarsal. At the end of this bony projection is a soft indentation marking the location of the cuboid. Anteriorly, the cuboid articulates with the fourth and fifth metatarsals. Posteriorly, it articulates with the calcaneus. On the medial surface, it articulates with both the lateral cuneiform and the navicular bones. Anteriorly, the cuboid articulates with the fourth and fifth metatarsals. Posteriorly, it articulates with the calcaneus. On the medial surface, it articulates with both the lateral cuneiform and the navicular bones. The navicular. It is located on the medial side of the foot forming the apex of the medial arch. Proximally, it articulates with the talus and distally with the three cuneiform bones. Laterally, it articulates with the cuboid. The navicular can be identified along its medial border by finding its prominent tuberosity about 2.5 cm obliquely anteriorly and inferiorly to the medial malleolus, the navicular. It is located on the medial side of the foot, forming the apex of the medial arch. Proximally, it articulates with the talus and distally with the three cuneiform bones. Laterally, it articulates with the cuboid. The navicular can be identified along its medial border by finding its prominent tuberosity about 2.5 cm obliquely anteriorly and inferiorly to the medial malleolus, the metatarsals. These are five long bones slightly convex superiorly. They form a rigid platform for the forefoot. The first metatarsal is by far the thickest forming a strong articulation with the proximal first phalanx. The distal heads of the metatarsals and proximal heads of the phalanges are larger and more prominent on the plantar aspect of the foot. These are five long bones slightly convex superiorly. They form a rigid platform for the forefoot. The first metatarsal is by far the thickest forming a strong articulation with the proximal first phalanx. The distal heads of the metatarsals and proximal heads of the phalanges are larger and more prominent on the plantar aspect of the foot, the phalanges of the feet. Like the hands, there are three phalanges for each toe, a proximal, an intermediate, and a distal. The first toe has only two phalanges, a proximal and a distal. They are long bones forming hinge-like joints. The smallest is the distal phalanx of the fifth toe. Like the hands, there are three phalanges for each toe, a proximal, an intermediate, and a distal. The first toe has only two phalanges, a proximal and a distal. They are long bones forming hinge-like joints. The smallest is the distal phalanx of the fifth toe.